My name is Marco Russo, and uh, the topic for today is uh, uh, what are the different types of many-to-many uh, -many relationships uh, in Power BI. So remember to silence your cell phones. Let me check mine. So you make sure you see, okay, no. Okay, it's silent, good. I use this just for the timing. And remember all the possibilities that pass offer. So you can see my references here. I will also show my email and Twitter account at the end. So this is just uh, myself. And uh, let's start with the session. So I don't want you to wait too much before we enter into the topic. My goal in the next hour is to try to explain to you what are the different types of uh, many-to-many -many relationships we can create uh, in Power BI. I will introduce uh, what is the classical uh, definition of the many-to-many -many relationship that usually is something that uh, connects uh, two business entities, what we call two dimensions in uh, a star schema, in the classical uh, uh, dimensional methodology. But even though these names are new to you, just, uh, you will just uh, see with a few examples what are the basic requirements that uh, uh, define the, the, the need for this kind of relationship. And this kind of relationship uh, has been always uh, possible in Power BI uh, since the very early versions, because uh, we, we are not using any particular tool or feature. We will talk about uh, cardinality of relationships, which, uh, which is another topic. And we will see that uh, we have uh, different type of uh, relationships in Power BI, which are the one-to-one, -one, the one-to-many, which have been always been, that, that, that have been always here in the, in the product. But we uh, have seen a new kind of relationship introduced one year ago that uh, is called many to many. And unfortunately, this creates some confusion because it to be confused with the many to many relationship between business entities. So you will see that I will try to avoid the definition of many to many relationship when I talk about many to many cardinality. So we have to pay attention to this detail. And we will try to define when this kind of relationship cardinality is useful, when it is not and uh, how to use it uh, if we have it, and what is the alternative, and which one is faster. Okay, so this is uh, the goal for this hour, and so you know what you can expect in the next uh, 60 minutes. So the idea is that we will uh, see these uh, relationships using two examples. I invite you, if you have questions during the session, since we don't have a large crowd, it's, it, it's easier to interact uh, in this case, and uh, I will repeat the question in case uh, just something because we're recording and so it will be easier for people who watch the recording to understand what is going on. So the first example, the first part of this session is about uh, the classical many-to-many -many relationship between dimensions, which is uh, nothing new, nothing, nothing specific of uh, Power BI. It's something that uh, could exist naturally in uh, the business entities we want to manage in our model. And uh, the idea is uh, that uh, potentially every time you have uh, two business entities, imagine for example products uh, and customers. Every time you have a table that connects two dimensions, like for example a sales table, you have a many-to-many -many relationship between products and customers, for example, because uh, a single customer can buy several products uh, and one product can be bought, bought by several customers. So just because we have a sales table, a product, and a customer table, uh, we already have a kind of many-to-many uh, -many relationship. Even though we usually don't define this kind of relationship as a many-to-many -many relationship between dimension, because uh, this is the result of the presence of uh, some uh, transaction, for example. The, the, the sale transaction defines uh, this, uh, this idea of many-to-many. Usually when we mention the many-to-many -many relationship in a model like uh, a model in Power BI or in a dimensional model, what we're saying is that uh, we have two business entities that don't have exactly a transaction or a number that identifies a measure that connects them. And the classical example is that of the uh, bank accounts. 
When you have a bank account, uh, you could have uh, not just one, but two or more people who are the owners uh, of the bank account. And when this happens, actually, we don't have a situation like, for example, the companies and the shareholders. Uh, because the shareholder of a company usually has a, a certain percentage of the company, 1%, 20%. And so in a way, we could still say, OK, yes, a company is owned by many people. But actually, the profit of the company could be split between these uh, people. When you think about the bank account, we have another situation. We have an amount. Uh, of deposit in the bank account. Uh, and we have two persons who can uh, enter the bank uh, and can withdraw the entire amount. Of course, as soon as one of these two persons uh, withdraw the entire amount, the second person will not be able to get anything. So we cannot just multiply the amount by the number of owners. But as long as the amount is available, both people can withdraw that amount. So if I look at the quantity available for a single person is the entire amount of the account. But when I look at the family, where two persons in the same family owns the same account, I cannot account, uh, I cannot sum the value of the same account twice. I will do what I call a distinct sum. So I will sum the accounts owned by at least one person in that family. And this could be applied to many other things. For example, imagine you have a customer, you, you you ask a few questions to this customer. For example, you ask, uh, what are the sports you play or you like? And so I provide a list of sports for each customer, which doesn't mean that I produce revenues uh, of $1 million to people that play tennis and another $1 million to people that play golf. So if I say, OK, what is the sum of uh, tennis and golf? $2 million? Maybe, but maybe no. Maybe it is just $1 million because everybody plays tennis, also plays golf. So, we don't know. Uh, but we know that we can uh, assign the amount uh, uh, to one of these two people. Now, this exists in the nature of a business, in the nature of uh, the entities we want to analyze. How do we represent this information in a model, in our data? So this kind of relationship, even though we don't have something to measure, we don't have a transaction to measure, but the simple existence of a relationship between a person and a bank account requires some data. And so when we create the model, we create uh, not two, but we need three tables. For example, we have a list of customers, then we have a list of accounts, number one to six, and we need a table in the middle that has the list of the connections between customers and accounts. So I will see this uh, table in the middle that we call a bridge table that actually creates a connection between the customer and the account, uh, defining which are the account of each customer and at the same time, who are the owners of each account. OK, so this is the content of the data. And I want to highlight that this table in the middle comes from the data source. I cannot invent the bridge table. You will see that this is important later. But we need three tables. The table in the middle is actually what defines the relationship. The relationship is defined by the presence of this table. If I didn't have this table, I would not have a relationship between accounts and account. And account. So this is the data that defines what we need. But uh, when we import these three tables, uh, how can we establish the physical relationship between customer and account that, from a logical point of view, is represented by this table in the middle, this bridge table? And so the idea is that when I import these two tables, I have two simple relationships, two one-to-many relationships. One connects account to accounts customers, and one connects customer to accounts customers. And uh, account and customer are two tables on the one side of the relationships. So we need only one row for each uh, customer and one row for each account in the two tables that you see in the two sides of this slide. And in the middle, we have the many side of these two relationships. So for those of you that are familiar with the idea of the star schema, we have a table in the middle, which is a fact table between two dimensions. But because this fact table actually doesn't have any measure, any number we want, we, we want to sum, 
Uh, it was called at the very beginning when these, uh, these terms were defined, it was called a factless fact table, uh, but uh, a better name to represent this table is a bridge table, a table that represents a bridge between two dimensions because these tables that uh, represent the, uh, the business entities are called uh, dimensions. So I have uh, a model here which is exactly what we have seen uh, in, uh, in the slide where you see that we have uh, customers, accounts, and accounts customers. So if I input these three tables, I can define this relationship. And you see we have another table here, which is just a table with the transactions that has uh, a list of transactions that I will show you in a moment. And the transactions are assigned to the account, because actually every operation happens on an account. Now, the idea is that if I sum all the transactions that I have for an account, I obtain the balance amount, the available amount for each account. So what happens if I import this data? And you see I'm using just the simple relationships one to many. As I said, let's take a look at the content just to make sure that we understand what we have. The, the content is identical to what we have seen in the slide. So we have uh, four customers, uh, Mark, Paul, Robert, and Luke. We have uh, six accounts. Uh, and for the purpose of uh, making it easier to understand what we're doing in terms of uh, uh, connection, we, instead of providing a number to each account, we provided a name, which is the name of uh, the owners of the account. But uh, this is like uh, a number, so it's, it's an information we will never use to identify the customer name analyzing the string. So this is just uh, to understand that uh, the fifth account in the row is actually the account owned by Mark and Robert. Where do I store the information that tells me that uh, this fifth account is uh, actually connecting two customers, Mark and Robert? This is the information in the bridge table. So the bridge table here has this connection. So I could have here a number. Um, usually the account number is just a, something strange that uh, you, doesn't have a meaning. But this is actually uh, something that allows me to understand that when I see Mark Robert, it could be the number assigned to, that, uh, to, to those two customers. So in the reporting, I understand better what I'm doing. Now, what happens if I have this uh, model with these three tables connect, connecting to the table with the transactions, just uh, the, name of, the name of the account or the number of the account and the amount of the account? What happens is the following. If I create a report and I include let me start this way, maybe just uh, remove for a second the customer here. So if I just use uh, the account name and I sum the amount column from the transactions table, the, the, the measure I'm using is just the sum of the amount. And I'll show you which uh, this is just a simple sum, okay? So I'm just summing the transactions. And if you look at the content of this table, you can realize that uh, there are no surprises. If I sum these transactions, I actually obtain exactly that total. I, I, don't, I don't see anything strange. Uh, what happens, however, if I include uh, here the customer? So if I include the customer, for example, in the columns, uh, you see that uh, for every customer, I simply see every number. Uh, the customer is not uh, filtering anything. And if I include only the customer in this visualization, so if I include the customer here, you see that the total of each customer is always 8,000. What is happening? Why the customer doesn't filter the accounts of the customer? Well, I go back to the, to the slide because this is actually explained uh, in the way the filter propagation works in Power BI. When you apply a filter to a column, for example, we apply the, the filter to the customer column of the customer's table, the filter automatically propagates following uh, the direction of the filter in the relationship. And in this case, we have a one-to-many relationship with a single direction filter that propagates the filter to the accounts customer's table. However, this filter does not propagate uh, to the accounts table. Why? Because uh, the relationship we have here, if you, if you look at this, the relationship we have here, sorry, is a relationship that is uh, moving the filter from accounts to accounts customers, but not the other way around. So because this is not happening, we are not filtering any customer because the filter propagation does not allow to do that. So at this point, if we find a way to enable the propagation of the filter, we can actually obtain the 
correct result. So what are the tools we have available to obtain this behavior in Power BI? We have one tool which is the ability to change uh, the propagation of the filter in uh, one relationship. So if I double click this relationship uh, and I go in the dialog box of uh, the relationship, you see that uh, this uh, setting is called cross filter direction and uh, enables provides two options. One is single, which is the default one, and the second one is both. Uh, when you set both, you're actually applying a bi-directional propagation of the filter. The filter propagates one to many, but also many to one, which means that now, if I have some filter active in the accounts customers, this filter will propagate to accounts, which means that when I filter one customer, this customer has two accounts, these two accounts are also filtered into the accounts table. When this happens, accounts continue to propagate the filter to the transactions, and so I will sum all the transactions of all the accounts owned by that customer. So without changing any line of code in my measures, if I go back to the report, what happens now is that the numbers are different. Every customer has a different amount. And if I include in this report also the name of the account here, and I write uh, this. So you see that now, if I drill down, you can uh, figure out uh, why each customer has a different number, because each customer is simply summing one, two, or three accounts, depending on the accounts that are owned by the customer. It just works, but uh, as soon as you introduce the bidirectional filter in any relationship of your model, you introduce uh, a behavior which we call a non-additive uh, aggregability of a measure. So if you look at the sum of amount uh, and you reduce the list just to the customers, try to figure out what should be the total of sum of amount if you sum all the customers. It will be a number greater than 8,000, right? It will be a, a bigger number. And, uh, this could be a problem to someone that doesn't understand the meaning of these numbers. So in a bank, usually bankers should understand this concept, otherwise I suggest you to change your bank because uh, <laughs> it's a problem. And, uh, but sometimes uh, when, when you have a complex model where you enabled a bidirectional filter for some other reason, there could be other reason to do that, uh, uh, this bidirectional filter is always active and is also affecting measures where we maybe didn't understand or didn't realize this could have had an effect. So one of the reasons why we suggested to not enable the bidirectional filter in the model is that yes, it is solving the problem for this measure and for this report, but maybe this is not the behavior I, want, I would like to have uh, for any other measure of this report. Now this report has only four tables, but imagine when you have many, many more tables. Uh, there is a second uh, consideration, which is uh, even though the numbers are correct, uh, I'm going to pay the price for the bidirectional filter also when it will not be useful. But I can identify those measures where this behavior is required. And the behavior that I'm describing is required for this measure. Because for this measure, I want customer to filter accounts through the bridge table. So, I can obtain the same behavior that we are, are observing now and the same uh, performance that we can get with the bidirectional filter applied to the model by using uh, a DAX function that enables this behavior into the DAX calculation. So now I'm gonna re uh, remove the bidirectional filter from uh, this relationship. So now uh, this is no longer a bidirectional filter. I return a single. By doing that, I uh, go back to the situation where I have always 8,000, sorry, always 8,000 in my model, so I, I always have 8,000 here, and uh, I can change the definition of sum of amount, so my measure sum of amount here, can be written in a different way, saying, okay, I want to calculate this expression, this measure, whatever expression you want, but you can change, uh, just for the duration of this calculation, the behavior of uh, the relationship that exists between uh, the accounts customer table and the account column and uh, the accounts table. 
The order doesn't matter, but usually we prefer to write uh, cross-filter user relationship specifying the many side uh, followed by the one side, because usually it is the many side that is uh, identifying already the entire relationship. And uh, once I do, uh, once I specify these two arguments, the third argument specifies uh, what is the direction I want to use. You can choose between both, none, one way. Uh, we use both in this case because what we want to do is we want to uh, enable the bidirectional filter between these uh, two columns. Uh, I know that this uh, uh, filter propagation was single, but uh, just for this calculate, it has to be bidirectional. When I, when I click enter, you see that now the behavior of the measure is identical to the behavior I had with the bidirectional filter in the model. The advantage of this approach is that uh, I don't affect uh, any other calculation in my model. I don't have to worry about uh, what is happening uh, in other parts of the model. I'm just affecting this measure. I don't pay a price uh, to other measures just because I enable the bidirectional filter here. So I could uh, talk more about this, but because the goal of this session is to understand the different type of many-to-many -many relationships, uh, I needed to define what a many-to-many -many relationship uh, is in the classical uh, model of uh, the, in the classical dimensional model, in a classical world of the business intelligence. Uh, if you have analysis series in multidimensional, it works the same way. The bridge table defines the many-to-many -many relationship between two dimensions. And we have seen that we can enable the bidirectional filter in the model or in uh, DAX using the cross filter, they uh, work using the same features of the engine. Now, one year ago, Microsoft released the feature which uh, introduced uh, uh, the, the feature that uh, Microsoft uh, released uh, is uh, the composite model that allows you to create uh, models getting uh, more than one data source from a direct query. Uh, and uh, you can also import in memory tables for aggregations, and it, it's a very powerful feature. In order to enable this feature, Microsoft had to implement an extension to the engine that introduced a new type of relationship that we can use in a model that uh, is not a composite model. And what I will do now, I will use uh, this additional feature to do something to solve a specific data modeling issue that um, can be solved with this relationship. So I will provide you a good reason to use a new type of relationship that uh, unfortunately has a name that is confusing because it is called a many-to-many -many cardinality in a relationship. But this doesn't mean that we have a many-to-many -many relationship. So let me try to explain this by starting from a business problem that introduces the scenario where I need a way where I can use and I will use this new feature. But at the same time, before using this new feature, I want to solve the problem without using the new feature. Because what I want to demonstrate is that uh, we didn't enable any new scenario. One year ago, when I had seen some articles, oh, finally we managed the many-to-many -many relationships in, in, in Power BI, I said, this is inaccurate for at least two reasons. First, the many-to-many -to -many relationship had been already implemented many years ago. Second, this feature does not support the many-to-many -many relationship, is another thing. Is the, is, is the ability to define relationships a different granularity, which is the title of the section. So let me try to explain what we're gonna do. I have a model where I have a sales customer product date. So the table in the middle, the sales table, defines its cardinality as uh, the cardinality of the dimensions, so of the tables that are connected to this uh, sales table. In other words, if I look at this model, I know that uh, I should have, uh, or I can have, one row in the sales table for each day, for each customer, and each product. So given a combination of customer, product, and date, I could have a row in the sales table. Technically, I could have multiple rows for the same date, the same customer, and the same product, but let's say that uh, this, the definition of the cardinality of the fact table sales uh, uh, is uh, a result of the dimensions of this table. And if I look at the definition of the tables that I connected, uh, I have to use uh, customer key and product key to connect uh, customer and product to sales. 
So I need to use a column that is unique on the one side of each of these relationships. So I need a single, I need a column that identifies one customer and a column that identifies one product. When you define a one-to-many relationship, you need a unique column in the table to define the relationship. You could have multiple unique columns in the table. For example, in a date table, I could have date, a date key. Uh, I can have the date as a number, as a string, and also as a date. But actually, all these columns are different representation of the same business entity. But what happens when I import in my model some other data that doesn't have, doesn't match the same granularity? For example, here we have a budget table, which could be an Excel file. The sum and define, I input in my model, but this budget file, this budget table, doesn't have the same cardinality of the sales table. First of all, is a budget for just one year, whereas uh, sales has a detail at the day level. I don't even have a day table connected to budget. I don't even have a date. This is the first thing. But the second thing is that uh, the budget table actually has um, representation of uh, data related to countries of the customer and brand of the products. So if you look at the content of the budget table, you see that the budget table has uh, an amount that uh, is the budget for a particular scenario, which is a dimension that is specific for the budget table, for a group of products, all the products of a certain brand, and all the customers in a certain country. So the granularity is different. I have uh, a small number of rows in the budget table and a large number of rows in the sales table. Nevertheless, uh, the attributes I have in the budget table are actually attributes that exist in the customer and in the product table. So I could say, well, there is a logical relationship between these columns that I highlighted here in the, in the, in the, in the slide. Because when I filter, when I create a report with uh, a group of products that have the same brand, I can potentially sum all the products of that brand for the sales table, and I can just retrieve the value of the budget for that brand in my report. So I can figure out, I want to use this budget table in my report with this data from the sales table, but I have a technical issue now. I cannot create a, a classical relationship between brand of the product table and brand of the budget table, because uh, the classical relationship is a relationship that is a one-to-many relationship. A relationship requires uh, one side of the relationship connected to a column that is unique in the table. And the problem is that the product table uh, has, has a column that is unique, probably two columns, product name and product key, but these two columns um, are not the brand. I cannot use them to connect to the brand. And the brand has the same value for multiple rows in the product table, so it cannot be used uh, to transfer, to create a classical relationship. So this is the initial problem, and not having the relationship, what happens? Why do I need a relationship? Well, if I go to my model here, this is the model you have seen in the slide. So you see that we have a day table, a sales table, a customer table, we have a product table, and here we have our budget table. Okay, so I just uh, decrease this a little bit, but just to show you that this is the model I have. And if I create a report using this model, what happens? Well, I can create a measure, because the budget is the budget for one year, I created a measure that filters the sales for one year only, because otherwise I'm not able to compare. So I created this as a measure, sales in 2009, which has just a filter that says, okay, I want to get the sales amount only for the year 2009. So this is the filter I'm applying here. But for the budget, the budget is just a column. I didn't even create a measure. This is just the column budget moved into the report. And I'm just uh, filtering one scenario because I have uh, three scenarios in my budget. What happens? Because I'm not filtering by, not by color, but by brand here. Because I'm not filtering by brand. Uh, sorry, I used the, the wrong brand, sorry. Uh, here, here we go. Let me let's start from here. So. If I use the brand column from the product table, what happens is uh, 
that uh, the brand color in the product table transfer its filter to the sales table. Because I'm filtering the brand here, and this brand propagates the filter to the sales table. And so my measure, sales 2009, is filtered by the brand. So far, so good. But uh, the same report shows budget with always the same value. Why? Simply because uh, there is nothing that propagates the filter to the budget table. What happens if I replace the brand here with a brand from the budget table? So instead of using the brand from the product, I use the brand from the, from the budget. Actually, I have the opposite behavior. Now I'm filtering the budget, but I'm not filtering the sales. And guess what? I would like to get the budget value now, and I would like to get the sales in 2009 of the previous uh, uh, calculation, uh, but I cannot if I don't do something. Now, let's start considering this. In reality, a relationship in Power BI is just a way to propagate a filter. And because it is just a way to propagate, to propagate a filter, I can use the DAX to manipulate filters in the filter context. So instead of using the standard implicit measure for the budget, I could create a new measure here. And I call this measure budget, or budget, which is equal to a calculate statement where I say, well, I want to sum the budget column from the budget table. But because I know that I'm filtering uh, the product table, and I know that I want to apply a filter to the budget table, I can write an expression that says, I want the budget, the, the, the brand column of the budget table to be filtered by whatever is the filter I have active in the brand column of the product table. So if I write an expression like this, what happens? I have an expression in DAX that reads what I have in the filter context in one column, and uh, iterates all the values in the brand uh, column of the budget table. If these brands are included in the other list, uh, then it returns a table that will apply as a filter to the budget table. And if you click enter, this works. This should work. If I include a raw budget here in the report. Let me just uh, fix uh, the visualization uh, format. Oh, I have to get used to the new ribbon. Uh, these new features every month, every month. OK. <laughs> That's fine. Oh, I like it. Imagine a world where this is every year. Oh, so boring. OK, so now you see that I'm, I'm keeping the budget uh, measure here, the budget implicit measure here, because I want to show you that at a certain point, I will change the behavior of the standard implicit measure. OK, at the moment, no. At the moment, uh, if I don't use a measure, I don't get the right number. Now, I have different ways to obtain this uh, propagation of the filter. I've shown you one technique, but actually there are many others. The one that uh, would be better these days uh, is uh, treat as uh, of values uh, of the product brand uh, and uh, budget brand. Why this is better? Just because the internal implementation is a bit, uh, it is, is a little bit more efficient. Treat as changes the data lineage of a table expression and reduces the overhead uh, in the, in the formula engine to manipulate this filter. Uh, another expression that you might have seen often is, uh, for example, the intersect. So I can write intersect, and I can write all uh, uh, budget brand, uh, and I want to intersect by values of uh, product brand. So this is another example of what I can do here. So there are many techniques I can use. Uh, there is also another one using a filter. But uh, basically, the idea is that all these techniques uh, requires you to write this code in every measure where you want to have this behavior. And uh, these techniques are not uh, particularly fast. Uh, three tests is faster than the other two. But we're talking about a marginal improvement. I mean, a marginal improvement for me is, OK, it is twice faster, which is nothing. I want. Uh, 10 times, 100 times faster. Okay, I, I, I need speed because now I have a small amount of data, but what happens if I have a, lar a large amount of data? This could be something that you know, reduces the interactivity with your report. So not to mention that uh, I have to copy and paste this code everywhere. And of course, now I'm managing a, a single uh, column. If I go back to my model, if you think about what I want to do at a very high level, 
I want to propagate the filter from the brand column of the product table to the brand column of the budget table. This is my high level relationship, is this one. And I want to propagate the filter from product to budget, not the other way around. My DAX code did exactly this. You could remove all the relationships in a model and you could create the relationship using the code I wrote and it would work. It would be slow, but it would work, okay? And uh, I should do the same also for country region at this point, of course, because uh, this way I obtain a, a, a complete uh, definition of this model. So basically, if I go back to my model and I uh, use what I would call the best practice for this kind of uh, um, technique, I would use three tests twice. Uh, the second time I use the country region, uh, the country region, country region from the budget here, and the country region from the customer here. And uh, maybe indenting the code a little bit better. We have something that I can see without having a problem because I have problems. If I see the code that's not indented well, I have a problem. Okay, so now, now this, is, uh, this is nice. Okay, so it works, it's nice, but uh, it is not uh, very fast and uh, it uh, requires maintenance. Every time I change something in my model, I have to review all the, all the filters. It could take uh, a while. And I can also make mistakes. Uh, let's say, okay, can I do something better? Can I work better with the data model, right? Can I reduce or maybe avoid the DAX code involved here, possibly getting something faster? So let's see what we can do. Um, if I go back to my model, the problem I'm observing here is that, yes, I cannot create um, a relationship because the granularity is not compatible, but guess what? There is a technique of uh, data modeling that is called Snowflake, uh, where I create uh, different tables to represent a business entity, and these different tables have a relationship together and represent attributes, group of attributes of this entity at different levels. In this particular case, I could do something that is not actually a snowflake, even though it's similar. Um, I could uh, create a table with a list of the brands. I mean, the only reason why I cannot create a, a one-to-many relationship is because I don't have a table that has one row for each brand. The moment I have this table, everything is different. And uh, this table doesn't require, the table I need doesn't require to read other data from my data source doesn't require new data. It's just a table that I can create with the data I already have. So I could create a calculated table. So I can go here with uh, the table tools, uh, new table. It's so new for me to write. Okay, so, and I can write here, brands, let me just uh, increase the font here. Brands, which is my table that has the list of the brands, will have all the unique values for example, distinct of product brand. I can start this way. What I get this way, all the unique values of the brand column in the product table. And now that I have this list, I could uh, do what? Well, EO, uh, sorry, I can uh, go here. Let me just reduce this. This table has one row for each brand. I can create a relationship here, which is a simple one-to-many relationship. And I create, can create a connection here, and this is also another one-to-many relationship. Now, if I create my report using this new brand column from the brand table, what will happen? I can try. I can go back here, and I can say, instead of using here the brand uh, the brand column from the product table, you see that this is what I'm using now, I remove this and I can use the brand column from the brands table, okay? Brands brand. And of course, now what happens is that uh, my measure that transfer the filter with DAX continue to work as before. But the budget column, which is an implicit measure, magically works, magically, not magically, it's just uh, regular behavior this is a regular behavior I'm filtering by brand, and the brand filters the budget. What happens if I have a budget that I don't have in the product table? Well, in the previous example, I would have uh, 
not seen that, uh, that budget. This, that, that budget would have been hidden by the lack of at least one product with a budget. But with this technique, I could show any budget. I just have to make sure that the brands table has all the brands. All the brands means that I have to include all the brands that are in product and all the brands that are in budget. Maybe I have new brands for the next year. Maybe I have uh, no budget for the next year for a certain brand. I don't know. So if I want to make sure that I have all the brands, I cannot just rely on this distinct product brand. I have to sum to this list using union, uh, for example, uh, distinct of uh, the brand. Sorry, I have to put a comma here. And then here, and I go to brand for, from the budget table. What is the result of this uh, function? A list that has all the brands from product and all the brands from budget, duplicated, included. Because union is like union all in SQL. So actually, if I click enter, I get an error now because uh, the result of this table is no longer unique. I would have duplicate value. And this is an error now because I, re I already have a relationship. If I didn't have the relationship, I would have seen the duplicated values. I just have to remove them so that I make sure that my table works. So if I write distinct, union, distinct, distinct, the external distinct has the only um, reason to, uh, has the only uh, role to remove the duplicated values from the result of union, okay? So this technique basically provides me a table that I'm sure has all the brands, no matter where they appear in my model. And if I do that, this model is guaranteed to work even though at a certain point I had a budget brand that doesn't exist in the product table. This is the only way to display new brands, okay? What I will show you later, now I will remove this model, but what I will show you later, including a new feature that I will show you in Power BI, is not able to do that. If you want to see the unique values that exist in any of the two sides of this special relationship we want to create, this logical relationship that joins the product brand and budget through the brand column, we need to use this solution. And this solution has another advantage. Now that I created two physical relationships, I have the best performance, potentially. Okay? This is the most performance solution. But this solution has one big issue. My user, okay, my user, let me define it. Imagine uh, I am preparing this model for business users that want to use this, this model in an intuitive, easy way. When they will see that they have the brand in the product table, in the budget table, and in a brand table, they will be disappointed. They will say something, they will send an email, maybe call, they will call me, I don't know. So probably this is too much. So probably I could uh, hide the many side of a relationship. Remember, it's always, it's always a good idea to hide a column when it is on the many side of a relationship because you don't want people to filter that column. You want to filter the one side of the relationship. So now at least the, the user will not get confused because now the brand is only in one place from a visible, uh, uh, in the visible columns. But I still have to explain to my user why the color of the product is under the product folder and the brand is under another folder. And guess what? When I go to the country region, I will have an additional issue because the country region is present in customer and stores. And if I create a table called the country region or countries, the question will be countries of what? The product, the, sorry, the, the customer, the store. So it could be ambiguous. Now, in an ideal world, at this point, I will define a logical entity, product, that has columns from different tables. In an ideal world, we will not have 
a website called ideas.powerbi.com where you can provide a suggestion for this. We live in the real world, and so we don't have this feature. So we have to adapt the physical layout of your model to the logical representation of the business entities that you want to have. Because of this constraint, we need a trade-off. We don't want to limit the ability to the user of navigating our model and, for example, to create a relationship, not a relationship, a hierarchy. Imagine you want to create a hierarchy that says brands, colors, because 90% of the times we want to see the brand and then drill down and see the color. A hierarchy will do that, but you can create a hierarchy only between two columns of the same table. Like, for example, when you go here and you drag and drop a subcategory to category, something like this, now you have a category here, category hierarchy, and you have category, subcategory. You make it easy to navigate in a predefined relationship. And guess what? Maybe that you have the budget by product category. And product category is exactly the first level of a hierarchy that has two or three or four levels. You don't want to put that column in another table. Okay? So because of this business requirement, I accept the idea that I say, okay, so remove this, I don't need this. I want to show the brand again. So this one, I want this to be visible. I don't want to hide this. Actually, I want to hide the brand's table. I actually want to hide this table at all. So what I want to do, if I go back here, I don't want to show this table to the user. I want to continue to use the brand column in the product table. Okay, But now, if I do this, and I repeat this also for the country, so let me create, uh, let me quickly create the same table for the countries. So I go here, countries is equal to distinct of union of distinct of the country region of the budget and the country region of the customer. Now I have my country region table. I go back here. I move this table here. I hide this table to the user. There is no reason the user see this, but this allows me to create the relationship. Okay. And my goal now is that, okay, now that I have this situation, what can I do? I want to go to, the, to my report. I want to remove the brand column that I had here, I want to just use the regular brand column from the product table, okay? Now, if I include this brand column, of course, what happens? Remember, my measure of budget is using DAX to do the job. Budget doesn't work, right? Now, based on what I explained in the previous section, actually, I have now an option here, my measure could transfer the filter from uh, the, 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 the table that I created, uh, uh, sorry, from the product table to the table I created, uh, obtaining uh, this way uh, uh, an implicit propagation. Because if you think for a moment, what I'm doing here in this line is I'm getting the current selection of the brand column in the product table, and I want to apply this as a filter to the brand column of the budget table. But now that I have uh, a connection in the model, I can obtain the same result saying, wait a minute, this relationship connects these two columns. If I get what I have active here in the product table and I propagate the filter to the branch table, which is not allowed by the current direction, but once I enable the bidirectional filter here, this will propagate the filter to the budget table. So if I write here, instead of uh, treat as, I can write, uh, cross filter, and I want to move the filter from this time the product table brand to the brand table brand in a bidirectional way. For the same reason we obtained before the behavior, sorry, I missed a comma here and I had to click enter here. So by using this cross filter, this cross filter now is like my three tests. What is the difference? Now, instead of using uh, the behavior of three tests that is based on the formula engine, I'm using the behavior based on the physical relationship in the model that is uh, delegating some of the work to the storage engine. And it is uh, way faster. It is way faster. 
So let me just check if uh, the measure raw budget now continue to work. This continue to work. Of course, my budget measure is not working. My budget measure is an implicit, it's not a measure, it's an implicit uh, sum of the budget column, and it's continued to not work. And now I simply implemented index uh, with a cross filter, what I, uh, what I said, uh, the bidirectional filter here. But if you think for a moment, why now I have one table and two relationships? Because uh, this is a way to obtain a physical connection between the product brand and the budget brand. And at a very high level, this relationship, this logical relationship uh, should be a one direction filter between product and budget, from product to budget, not the other way around. Now, if you think for a moment, if I change uh, this direction to both, now I have a bidirectional filter in the model, and uh, I accept this bidirectional filter because, yes, this is a bidirectional filter in the model in a relationship, but at a very high level, I'm defining a single direction relationship, uh, a single direction filter in a relationship that connects brand uh, product to brand budget. This is what I'm really doing at a very high level. This is a technical implementation of this high level relationship that I can have between these two tables. And if you think for a moment, product is a dimension. Product is a business entity. Budget is a fact table. Budget contains uh, numbers I want to aggregate. And what I'm solving is not a many-to-many -many relationship. What I'm doing is a, a connection at a different cardinality. Because I'm not able to connect the budget to the product table, I'm connecting the budget to the brand table. By the way, there was another way to solve this problem, creating one row in the product table for each brand with a fictitious product that doesn't exist, okay? I'm not saying that it's impossible to do that, but if you think for a moment, you may not like to do this for other reasons, and it cannot be easily applied to other dimensions, because it could create confusion and uh, the, the data could be hard to read. This technique has been always possible in Power BI, since we have the bidirectional filter, since forever, and is the faster one, because this technique relies on the storage engine. When I say faster, it means that uh, we consider a large uh, relationship, a relationship that has uh, one million of unique values in the, or, or more. When we enable this behavior, we could consider this uh, relationship large when we have uh, maybe 100,000 uh, values. It starts to be slow because we are enabling the bidirectional filter and so on. But when you use DAX, it is start to be slow at 1,000, 100, okay? So it could be, it could be you know, the, the, the limit where we, we start to see a degradation in performance is very different. So for this reason, if I have a large number of unique values here, I want to use this model all the time, period. But as I said, one year ago, Microsoft introduced the feature that allows me to obtain the same behavior without having to create uh, one table and two relationships. So now I'm gonna remove this, and I just connect brand to brand. When you see this, uh, there is a warning here that says, oh, there is, this relationship has cardinality. Cardinality, many, many. Because, uh, this relationship is connecting two tables and none of these tables has a primary key for the relationship. And uh, the problem of the wizard, despite my request, is that the default, uh, the default settings are usually not a good idea. Because uh, yes, I want to create a bidirectional filter, but if you follow my explanation, I don't want this high level relationship to be bidirectional. I want product filters budget, not the other way around. And if you click here, guess what? 
We want this product filters budget. If you enable this as a single direction filter, chances are that you can also make this relationship active, which would not have been possible with a bidirectional filter because it would have been created a circular dependency and it was impossible to activate. So you, if you understand what we're doing, when I click OK, what happens is that I have a relationship that connects uh, products to budget at a different granularity where I don't have a primary key, but the relationship is a single direction relationship. This is the logical relationship I obtained using two physical relationships where one was a bidirectional filter. But in this case, this bidirectional filter was safe. We see this uh, approach with a customer table. This is safe because uh, I will never, ever, ever add other relationships to the country's table. And uh, it is just an artifact to obtain what I did here. Now, guess what? Which one is faster? How many of you vote for this uh, relationship to be faster than this? Raise your hand. How many of you vote for this one is faster? How many of you says uh, they are the same? OK. So this one is slower, and it is slightly better than the DAX code. But I like it, because it saves me time. <laughs> it saves me time writing my DAX code. And if I have only 16 brands, 20 values, it's fine. The difference will, not, will never be visible, OK? Come on. I mean, if I have 20 unique values, which is what happens most of the times, that's fine. But if you have uh, 20,000 unique values in this column, you should do this. Because yes, you have to write a calculated table, blah, 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 but, but, but it is, you, see, you will see the difference, believe me. Now, another important thing is this table does not has any new data. I obtain this table automatically. At a certain point, I wonder, why you didn't create this table automatically? I, because it, I mean, it, it's, a, it's an automatic operation. But there are reasons to do that. And basically, uh, I would suggest you to create this table physically only if actually you have uh, thousands of unique values. You can, you can try your benchmark in your model, but uh, a thousand, I will, I, for sure, I, uh, 1,000 or more, I will create this table, for sure. I will not, because uh, the, the query plan generated is very different. So I can remove this from here, and I can create my bidirectional filter. Well, sorry, not by my many-to-many -many cardinality relationship. And uh, this is a single customer filter budget, uh, relationship active, and I have this. OK? So it's very, use, it's, it's very easy to get confused. I see many people activating this relationship just because they have some duplicated value in a table. Um, but then, uh, because the default is a bidirectional filter, they get confused by other, you know, side effects. So they had to disable other other relationships. Uh, if you understand how it works, and if, if you understand the correspondence with the other uh, technique, uh, this is actually a technique that you can use. Question. I repeat the question. The question is, what happens if I have uh, uh, brands in the budget table that uh, don't exist in the product table? This technique will not show that budget. You will see the value in the total, because in the total you're not filtering anything. But as soon as you filter a brand, you only see the, the brands that exist in the product table. Just like the solution that I created when I uh, made uh, the the table brands a hidden table. Because if I hide the brands table, I lose the ability to see those brands. So when I, ex when I decide that I want to make my model more usable, I have the problem. Remember, in an ideal world, this will not be an issue because I will use the brand column of brands table in a logical view called the products. And this will be transparent to you. We will not have any problem. 
uh, not in an ideal world, uh, and we have to live with some uh, trade-off. So you have the option of, of uh, making the branch table visible, so you don't have to worry about anything, but the model becomes uh, less usable because you have uh, attributes of the same entities split around different tables. Okay, question. Yes. This is going from a many to a one and a one to a many. Thank you, because this is exactly the content of the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Question. So, sorry, can, can you talk louder? I don't. I'm not sure I understand the question. The customer table here is connected to the budget table by country region because the country is an attribute of the budget. Uh, we didn't see the country, but like we have the budget by brand, we have the budget by uh, country. And the country is just an attribute we have in the customer table that groups a few customers. So ideally, I, I want to create a, a report where I show the data by, by country, for example, okay? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Mm, well, <laughs> the problem, the pro, no, okay, but I, I, I would, I, <laughs> it's interesting, the question, but, uh, but uh, the problem is that you would have this situation, you have, uh, the problem is not the, what you have here, but the problem is that you would have two relationships that filter the same column. And uh, we have to figure out what is the, the meaning of that because uh, imagine you have uh, two date tables. Uh, I suppose that you have two date tables. You connect it to two different date columns like the date uh, of the order and the date of the shipment. So if you have the budget table with uh, the column is the same, it has uh, two relationships. So uh, I need to understand what is the meaning of what you want to do before. <laughs> Yes, but the customer favorite brand means that uh, you want to group. Uh, so potentially, you would like to use that as a way to group the products rather than the budget. And then from the, and then from the product, you filter the budget. So I see this as a, you know, it, it would be more, probably more interesting to connect the customer to the product table uh, through some other technique and, and then evaluate what to do. But uh, I, I mean, it's... Uh, is technically yeah. yeah okay okay um, yeah 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 no no I understand but I think we need another half an hour to discuss this so <laughs> I, I like the, the idea but uh, maybe later we can talk uh, I want to recap what we have seen so far because I want also to uh, you know if you have a some uh, dinner appointment, maybe that uh, you don't want to stay here for uh, the night. So, the, um, what we have seen so far, so let me recap. We started from a model where we didn't have a relationship, and this relationship uh, uh, could have been created by using DAX, because DAX basically is a technique that transfer a filter. We have seen that we can use treat as, we can use in, we can use intersect, which are different techniques that can transfer the filter. Um, it is very flexible, you can do any strange thing you want, but uh, you have to manage an increasing complexity of your measures uh, in the model. Um, performance, not ideal, because uh, even though you use three tests, which is faster than the alternatives, we are still talking about marginal improvements, not about orders of magnitude of improvement, which is what we can obtain by using the relationships. So when we introduced the calculated tables, we introduced uh, something that allowed us to create what is called a snowflake schema from the point of view of sales. But at this point, because we had uh, tables that define the right granularity of the entities we want to manage, we were able to connect the dots. 
But this introduced the need of having uh, the attribute uh, of the same business entity split in different tables, and we said, ah, we don't like this. We want uh, the user to be able to, you know, continue to use the, the, the columns in the product table or in the customer table. This is just uh, the technique in DAX to create uh, the calculated table. And uh, we introduced the bidirectional filter in the model because the bidirectional filter here is safe because uh, I am using these uh, two relationships as a technique to obtain a different relationship that is a single re direction relationship at a very high level. So at a high level, I'm connecting customer to budget one to many or better in a single direction and not the other way around. So actually in the model for the, my business entities, I don't have a real bidirectional filter. I had the bidirectional filter at a physical relationship level, but not at the logical relationship level. The relationship that I've shown you is called a weak relationship because it has uh, the problem of not showing on the one side that we don't have uh, the blank row. When you mentioned uh, what happens if I have a brand in the budget that doesn't exist in the product, when you have a regular one-to-many relationship, in the worst case scenario, you see a blank row. The weak relationship is a relationship that doesn't generate the blank row. We have several weak relationships in a composite model. Every time you connect two tables that come from two different data sources in direct query, uh, you have a weak relationship, even though it is a one-to-many relationship. The many-to-many -many cardinality relationship is always a weak relationship, even though it connects two tables in the same data source or in memory, like in this case. Uh, we have an article on SQLBI.com that enters in more detail about strong and weak relationships explaining uh, this technical detail. But uh, from a data modeling point of view, what I really wanted to uh, highlight uh, is exactly what uh, one of you observed, which is, uh, wait a minute, so what we define many, many in reality, in reality, when you look at the physical uh, model is different. If you think about what we did now, we have a list of products, uh, we have uh, the budget, the budget is defined uh, for a group of products, all the products of this brand in this country, and what we had in the middle is a table brands uh, that defined the chain of relationship uh, this way. We connect product and budget using many, one, one, many. So at the end, when you look at the very high level, is a many-to-many -many cardinality in the logical relationship that connects products and budget. But what we did at the beginning was very different. We had the two dimensions, two business entities with an identity key. We had the ID of the customer, we had the ID of the account, and we created a many-to-many -many relationship between two dimensions with a table that uh, has to be read from the data source. We don't know the table accounts customers until someone provides us this list. And when you look at this, this model, you see that uh, now customer and account are connected through one, many, many, one. So if I see the high-level relationship here, this is still a many-to-many -many relationship. Actually, this is the many-to-many -many relationship between two dimensions, but it is obtained through a chain one, many, many, one. This is the real many-to-many -many relationship between business entities. Whereas the other one, many, one, one, many, is a relationship at a different granularity. that does not and cannot be confused with the other one. These relationships introduce non-additivity of the measures. Also, when you have uh, the different cardinality, think about what happens if I filter by color. Just show you this quickly because uh, I didn't show, but uh, if I go here and I include my, because now I have uh, removed this, but uh, if I include my measure here, or even just if I use budget, uh, what happens if I introduce the color here? I show you. Uh, not here, but here. If I have the color and I drill down, you see that when I drill down at the color level, I see always the same value for the budget for the color. I see the, because I don't have a budget by color. I mean, if you think about it, I don't have a budget by color. I had the budget by brand. But uh, at this point, the, the, 
what I don't, what, what I suggest you to do is not to expose the budget as an implicit measure. You want to control if you are at the right level of granularity or not. So every time you have a, a relationship at a different cardinality, using the many, many cardinality relationship, you have to think about what do you want to do in this case? Do you want to see, to show this number or do you want to show blank? Because if you are navigating the model at a level that is not compatible with the relationship you have, you may want to display blank, for example. And so probably we want to create a specific measure to do that, that control this behavior by applying some technique. Now we have different techniques, but uh, uh, one technique we could use is uh, we could count uh, the products uh, that are visible, count rows of products, uh, and uh, the um, products that are visible at the budget granularity. And I just uh, have to do a small, but this is just an example because we could have other technique to use. I just want to show you something that you can uh, easily reuse uh, as a pattern. So if I compute the number of products, uh, uh, removing the filter from the product table and restoring the filter at the budget granularity, which is the product brand, comparing these two numbers, if the two numbers are the same, so if this is equal to product at budget granularity, I know that I'm navigating the model at the granularity that is compatible, otherwise I will display a simple blank. So this is, I think, the minimum you should do when you have this. So for this, I'm saying, yes, the, the, the relationship is easy to introduce, but then you have to think about the, the consequences. Uh, we don't, we have other consequences in the other relationship, but uh, for example, if I do this, I preserve my visualization to display a number when it is not really useful. And this is especially useful when you remove, for example, the brand from the report, because now that I have only the colors, I never see a value here, but I continue to see the total, because the total level is compatible and it works. And I don't have to, to write a complex uh, analysis of the filter context for this. But the important part of this uh, uh, analysis of, of, of this session is uh, basically this slide, which is exactly what is the difference between a many-to-many -many relationship uh, between dimensions and a relationship that works uh, with a many-to-many -many cardinality? One, many, many, one, many, one, one, many. The table below, the table at the bottom, brands, is obtained by the data that you already have. The table uh, that is a bridge between the two dimensions must come from the data source. So understanding this will guide you choosing the right technique uh, to create your model. And more important, remember the relationship. We define a relationship that is a single direction product budget that internally is obtained by a bidirectional filter between product and brands and a regular one to many single direction product budget. Okay, so when you are doing this, you're really doing this. These two techniques are equivalent in terms of result. The one at the bottom is faster but suggested only if you have thousands of brands or more. So this is uh, what we have seen. There are technical terms here, bridge table, normalized, snowflake, but uh, even though you are not familiar with this terminology, I think that with this example, you have uh, enough information to make uh, uh, a better choice. Remember to evaluate the session. As Alberto said, we fight a lot at what is the better session, so you know what to do. <laughs> well, it's not important if I am uh, the third or fourth of the bar. Important is Alberto should be below me. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else doesn't matter. I'm just uh,